All right. So let's continue our uh, lectures on uh, numerical techniques. And I leave the floor to Anders. Thank you. OK, good afternoon. So yeah, so yesterday, you know, my goal was to, you know, introduce um, some models and, you know, their motivation from primarily the condensed matter uh, perspective. And I know, you know, some of you would have preferred maybe if I do something slower on the blackboard. I'm uh, sorry if, uh, if, if I assume too much, uh, uh, you know, condensed matter background. I didn't really know what uh, the audience would be here. So I'm, I'm uh, not going to do the blackboard today either because I didn't plan that. And my handwriting is terrible. So I'm sure I can guarantee you that you would not, uh, you would like that even less, let's say. So, uh, but today will be a bit different because now I'm really going to start to talk about, uh, you know, the numerical, well, some uh, numerical techniques. Um, and then again, it's a little bit different to connect, uh, a little difficult to connect the communities because, uh, you know, we work maybe on the same physics questions, but it's still quite different if you work on uh, abstract uh, math with continuum field theory. And now I'm going to tell you about some you know, in comparison, very simplistic uh, calculations with Hamiltonians, but maybe to you it seems like uh, gibberish uh, anyway, if you haven't uh, seen it before. So, you know, I, I don't think I can satisfy the whole audience here, but uh, I, I hope at least some of you will, will uh, uh, in, enjoy this, uh, you know, which is what I was asked to talk about. So, you know, I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, teach you about some uh, lattice models and numerical methods. So. Uh, I decided to talk about three methods, and the first one is sort of the most simple-minded thing you can do, but still it can get quite complicated when you actually want to, to push it. And what, what, what I mean push it is, well, we want to study big systems because that's where we can see the low energy uh, behaviors that we can eventually connect to, to some uh, uh, field theory description. So, you know, for Exact diagonalization, well, you know, the Hilbert space grows very rapidly. We cannot do much, but one can actually do something. And it's also uh, a very nice way, I think, to, to, to start to, uh, to, to get some new aspects of uh, uh, quantum many body physics. <clears throat> okay, so we'll talk about some, uh, how we do it again, not doing any, uh, any sort of computer implementation stuff, but at least hopefully it's still conveying, you know, what the, the principles are in, in some details. And then I will show some examples as well. So the next thing which will be tomorrow or, or uh, likely a very quick introduction to what's called matrix and tensor product states. So there I will not do a lot of details, but just, uh, you know, let you know, uh, you know, that there are su such uh, methods out there. And the, probably the main topic, which is you know closest to my uh, heart as well, is quantum Monte Carlo methods. So then uh, I will not as, uh, assume that you know classical Monte Carlo. So I will introduce that, and then a, a couple of uh, different ways to uh, to deal with uh, quantum uh, systems. So uh, introduction to the uh, exact diagonalization part. What I will do today, <laughs> basically, you know, we want to use uh, symmetries to block diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So that's, you know, mainly what I will uh, talk about. And here I say, I will not use uh, group theory here, which, you know, for the audiences I normally teach to, that's a good thing because people are not necessarily very familiar with group theory. Well, here, maybe that's exactly what you would, would like to hear about the, you know, the group theory aspect of it. Uh, but anyway, I will focus on some, you know, very simple systems where you really don't, uh, uh, need that uh, kind of uh, lingo uh, at all. Uh, okay, so I will also do, explain to you a little bit about what's called the Lanchos method, which uh, we can use uh, to reach slightly bigger systems if we only need the ground state and some low-lying uh, excitations. <clears throat> and then I will uh, give some examples of what we can actually uh, do with the you know, exact diagonalization within the limits to very small system sizes. So in particular in one dimension, but by which I mean one plus one, of course, uh, we can actually study some cases that uh, correspond to famous, uh, you know, conformal uh, field theories like this uh, J1, J2, uh, you know, frustrated Heisenberg chain. 
Okay, so I may not be able to cover all this today because I, I will go a little bit uh, slower than I, uh, I did uh, in, in my expose yesterday. Uh, okay, let me let me uh, let me know if I should uh, you know uh, go slower and and uh, uh, and so on. Um, okay, so the you know primary example I want to to use here, or at least have in in the back of of our minds, is the Heisenberg chain. Okay, so we talked about the Heisenberg model uh, yesterday. So these will be spin one half operators on a, on a linear chain. Uh, you know, normally with periodic boundary conditions, that's what we want to do uh, when we do uh, uh, exact diagonalization. So uh, n plus one here means uh, uh, one, right? <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about how we would actually store the state in a computer, even with, uh, we, uh, though I will not discuss any detail, but, but let me just point out an interesting aspect for spin one half system. We have up and down spins, right? So a compact representation of the states in the computer is to use the bits to, to represent spins, right? And uh, why is that good? Well, it's very compact. And of course, in an integer, you can uh, not put uh, a lot of spins, maybe, you know, 32 or 64, depending on what uh, kind of computer you have. But with exact diagonalization, we can anyway not reach systems larger than that. So we can, uh, you know, uh, represent these spin states by the bits. And then, you know, this label here, you know, is automatic because the computer interprets those bits as, a, as an inter integer. So that's, that integer will uh, uh, represent our uh, state. So we have. Uh, you know, if we, before we use any symmetries, our uh, our Hamiltonian has two to the n uh, uh, states, right? Uh, okay, so so th that's all I want to say about you know how to to store the states. But you see the point that we have the bits, and we get automatically a, a label corresponding to that. Now we don't have to do that, and in fact, if uh, if we have some systems with a you know larger local Hilbert space than just two a two level system, then we or two two uh, local states, then uh, you know maybe we want to do something else. We can still do the bits, but maybe we want to actually just store our states in a in a in a vector and you know have have some functions to to extract the the state from from the vector. By the way, you know, in, in computer languages, you can access these these bits, right? So if you want to know what what the spin at some location is, you can examine uh, uh, the bit content uh, of of your integer representing the state, and you can also manipulate the bits, right? So you can can uh, you know flip uh, these bits, which corresponds to flipping uh, spins, like you would have in this interaction here. You know the uh, x x and s uh, s y y interactions. You know they combine to to this uh, uh, term here, which you know flips a pair of antiferromagnetic spins. And you see that this you know also conserves uh, uh, the magnetization, the, the total uh, magnetization of the system. Okay. So any questions about that? <clears throat> okay, so now in principle, if we don't use any symmetries at all, we just have to, well, go, let me flick back here. Uh, we, we just need to, to construct this matrix. So we need to take, you know, for each state J, we have to act with all of these terms of the Hamiltonian. Some of them will, will just multiply, you know, because they are diagonal, they will just multiply the same state by a factor. Uh, uh, but, but these operators will flip two spins, so we connect, uh, you know, we get some off diagonal contributions. So once we have done that, uh, you know, then we, we just, uh, you know, have a matrix of size two to the n square, and uh, then, uh, you know, we, we uh, use uh, the computer to diagonalize uh, uh, that. And what, what that gives us is the matrix U that uh, you know this uh, unitary or orthogonal transformation that uh, uh, that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. So then, uh, if we want to compute some you know expectation values or matrix elements, 
we we just have to transform you know we have to write down the matrix for our operators as well <clears throat> and we have to transform those to uh to our new basis in that way right um Okay, the problem which I mentioned a few times already is that, you know, if n is large and you would like to go to the thermodynamic limit, so you may want n to be really large. Here, you know, 2 to the n, you know, becomes too big to work with in practice already when n is 20 or something like that. So what can you get out of, you know, results for 20 spins? Uh, maybe not, uh, not too much. Um, and, and the reason is that, you know, it takes for, for an M by M matrix, the, the time uh, taken to diagonalize it scales like M cubed. So that's, that's the main bottleneck. So you can see if M is like a, a million, you know, it takes, uh, you know, on the order of 10 to the 18 operations to, uh, to uh, diagonalize that. That would be if, <clears throat> if N is 40, then you, you are, you know, two to the, for this, like a million. Yeah, please. Uh, right. So you can see even a matrix matrix multiplication takes of the order M cubed, right? So, um, uh, you know, because, yeah, you, you know, that just the, 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 the uh, each element and, uh, and each of them will scale like that. So, you know, the, the diagonalization involves a lot of multiplications and and similar uh, operations. So, so yeah, it's very time consuming. At some point, maybe, you know, the storage could also become a problem, right? If you really want to store the whole matrix, that could be a problem, but often the matrix is very sparse. So you don't need to store the whole thing. You can, uh, you know, do some uh, uh, more efficient uh, storage. <clears throat> okay, but what you really want to do, if you can, you know, in some cases, you really don't have a lot of symmetries. If you have some disordered uh, system, for example, and you know no uh, conservation laws that you can exploit, uh, then you cannot do what I'm saying here. But if you can, you want to use some symmetry to reduce the matrix to a block structure. And you know, I think uh, you know. Of course, you know, know what that means. There are some conserved quantum numbers uh, labeling these blocks. And sometimes we can use, uh, you know, several symmetries. So then we can start with one and then we can further break up the blocks into smaller pieces. And now we can diagonalize them one by one because, you know, since uh, they correspond to some conserved quantum number, uh, they don't communicate with each other, so to speak. So they, uh, so this M, <coughs> M cube now will apply to, you know, a much smaller M, right? Uh, so, but you know, that doesn't actually help that much. You can reach around 40 spin one halves uh, in, in that way. <clears throat> so let me show you the simplest example of how to uh, use uh, a conservation law. So the model we are looking at, it conserves the total magnetization, which is, you know, uh, this sum here, right? Uh, <clears throat> so we can exploit that by constructing blocks for different M. So when the Hamiltonian acts, acts on a block with a fixed M, of course, M doesn't change. <clears throat> so uh, in, uh, in, in this kind of scheme that I, I showed you before, let me go here. Uh, you know, that just corresponds to reordering the states in some way that, you know, all the ones that have a given magnetization, they appear consecutively. <clears throat> so that, that means that this automatically, uh, you know, constructed label, so let, this is an example for uh, n equals four, uh, and in the sector of uh, zero magnetizations, so again, one and zero corresponds to up and down, right? So these are the states where, where this m is uh, zero. Uh, these are all of the ones that have m equals zero. But now I need to give them new labels, right? So this, maybe I want to call this state one, two, three, four, five. But the integer you get from the binary representation is, of course, not that. <clears throat> so that means that you actually have to go through all your states one by one, keep the ones that 
have a zero and mag zero magnetization. And basically you do it in the order of these. You start with all zeros and then you, you know, add one, add one and one. So then you get higher and higher numbers, but these are only the ones that have zero magnetization. So now, you know, this S1 means the, you know, the integer that you actually have stored. It's the integer three binary representation here. Uh, but so now you have six states in that block <clears throat> out of a total of, you know, two to the four equals 16 uh, uh, states. All right. So that, that's a very easy uh, symmetry to exploit. So, so that's illustrated here, you, you, you get these blocks. So what can we do next? Well, uh, another symmetry that often is used is when we put the system on a, uh, on a periodic lattice, we of course have uh, some crystal momentum that we conserve uh, and, and that, can, <clears throat> that will break up these blocks into uh, groups of states that have different momenta. Uh, but now it's a little bit more complicated. These basis states with a you know, fixed momentum, you really have to construct. It's not just reordering of, of the states. The, these are not you know, states with any, any, any fixed momentum. Uh, so I will tell you about how to, how to uh, do that, okay? Momentum states. <clears throat> so we have uh, the system on a, on a ring, N spins on, on a periodic, uh, chain. Uh, of course, we have translational invariance, uh, uh, you know, with uh, if we translate by an integer uh, number of lattice spacings, right? Um, so, so what, what does K uh, uh, correspond to here? Well, so if we translate one step, we get out this exponential uh, factor, right? Um, similar to the continuum, but now we only have uh, you know, a, a discrete number of k values because of, of the discreteness. Of course, we have to have as many uh, k states as we have real space states, right? <clears throat> um, uh, finally, well, so uh, the number of k points, uh, you know, that we have is, is, uh, is this, right? Uh, uh, okay, so so let's let's define the translation operator, and of course we can just define it in terms of some re re indexing, right? So we we add one uh, to, or or I guess I subtracted one <clears throat> from each index here, so one becomes n, two becomes one, and so on. So that's my shifted uh, basis state. Uh, okay, so now we know that this translation commutes with the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, so then uh, that means we can exploit this uh, symmetry. So how do we actually construct the momentum state? Well, it, it, it's very simple. It's just the uh, discrete Fourier transform, uh, of course, of, <clears throat> of some state. So, uh, so here I start with some state A. So that could be any of these basis states that we talked about before. So some, uh, you know, uh, up and down uh, uh, configuration. So I call that the representative state for a, mom a momentum state that will be constructed out of that by translations. So now I translate it in all possible ways. Uh, and I put this Fourier coefficient in, in front of each of them. So now you can very easily check. I, I will not do it, but you know you can. It's almost uh, trivial, right? If you <clears throat> if you translate one more time, or you translate it once, so then you get t to the r plus one here, and then you just do a relabeling, and then you see that i k comes out uh, in front of it because it's a periodic uh, sum, right? <clears throat> so you still get exactly the same. Uh, terms, the, the uh, factor in front has just uh, shifted by e to the ik, all right? Uh, but there's one, one little uh, twist here. You know, when you translate your uh, state, uh, 
potentially you can, uh, uh, if the state has a certain periodicity, you can come back to the one you started from. So I, I show some examples here. So <clears throat> uh, if you take the four state example and I do you know, two of these basis states that we talked about before. So this one is now what I call the representative. And, and why do we call it the representative? Well, because it sort of represents this whole group of four translated spins. So when I have, you know, constructed this momentum state, you know, starting from this one, it of course contains all of these as well. So that means if I construct another momentum state, let's say starting from that one, it's actually the same state, right? It just differs by, by a phase. So out of a whole, you know, cycle of states like that, I should only pick one of them to make my momentum state, right? <clears throat> Otherwise, you know, I have some, uh, you know, uh, equivalent states in, in the basis I construct. But then uh, uh, the twist is like, you know, for a generic state, you know, you translate n times. So you translate one, two, three, four, then you come back to that one, right? But if the state has some other periodicity, you only want to translate it up to when it comes back to itself. So in, uh, in this case, uh, you know, you, you in some sense only want, want to include, you know, two of them. You can actually still include, you know, all four translations, but then you have two copies of each of them. <clears throat> and that will actually affect the normalization constant here, right? If, because you have now some, uh, uh, you know, multiple, in this case, two copies of, uh, of the same state. So when you when you choose your your representatives, you have to make sure that you only pick one, you know, from from this group. Uh, and the convention would be it, it doesn't really matter which one you pick, but you know, since you will you know make these representatives in some systematic way, starting from uh, from all zeros and increasing by one, <clears throat> it's natural to take the the smallest number you know in the binary representation as your representative so here you see this is the number three right this is the number six and so on so this is the smallest so that one you you will uh, always uh, pick uh, to make your momentum state <clears throat> and you know this is of course why the momentum uh, basis can be smaller right or, or the like the block becomes smaller because the original basis include included all of these, right? But now you only make one momentum state, but you can of course make it for, for uh, any K, uh, but for you know, each K is a different block. So for a given K, you only got one state uh, here. In this case, you only get one state out of these two. <clears throat> um, all right, so so that's how, so, so now you, you don't need to actually, uh, you know, store this whole uh, thing here. You just know that, you know, you store that number, which is the number three, and you store that number, which is the number five, I think. Uh, and you, you just will know that it represents that sum. All right. <clears throat> so that's just uh, repeating that. Well, so now let's look at this. Uh, uh, issue that the sum, if I really, uh, you know, keep n always in the sum, even if the periodicity may be uh, smaller than n, uh, that will affect the normalization. So it can happen that, you know, if I translate r times, I come back to a. Of course, if I translate n times, I always come back to a, but it, it can happen for smaller r. <clears throat> then if that happens, and if, if you look at you know, the, the coefficients in front, you see that the first time I get one, the second e to the minus k r and so on. Uh, so if r is n divided by two, I would only get, get two of them, right? But r could be you know, much smaller than n, then you get uh, several uh, contributions. <clears throat> so now you may, may uh, 
see that this is like you know points on the unit circle right equally spaced uh, points uh, on the unit circle uh, so now something very interesting can happen uh, in general this whole thing will vanish right if you really have equally spaced uh, points on uh, on the unit circle just that's that just vanishes what does that mean it means that state is incompatible that representative state that you started with is incompatible uh, with the k that you have chosen <clears throat> okay so there are some special case here where the cancellation doesn't happen namely if all these are one right and that happens if uh if uh, k times r s n 2 pi right then all these numbers are one so then you really get you know a, a factor some factor uh, that is not zero multiplying that state and it's okay <clears throat> so when you make this basis you always have to uh, to check when you have found the periodicity of a state which is easy to do right you just translate it and check when do you get back to where you started from uh, unless this condition holds uh, which uh, you know you can write in in some simple simpler way because k itself con contains two pi as well right so it's i think i i write it here <clears throat> uh, k n two pi that means that m you know if if uh, uh, if uh, k itself is a m times two pi i guess i didn't write that here uh, you know k i should have well it, it's here right k is m two pi divided by n so you see that the two pi's cancel and this condition eventually is, means that that m multiplying k has to be divisible by n divided by r right so uh, which is as many how many of these uh, you know copies you get with, with factor one <clears throat> uh, okay so so that you you have to check for so if, if that's not true you you simply don't include that state in your momentum basis it simply doesn't e exist all right so what is the normalization then well so in uh, in general if if all these uh, uh, if, if r is n so that all these uh, factors appear and there's no multiple copies it's very easy to compute the normalization <clears throat> otherwise you, you have just have to take into account that the you know in some sense the sum is only up to r minus one and and there's a factor n divided by r here so you see that when you take the overlap that will uh, affect the normalization so the the overlap is n squared divided by r R A, I mean the periodicity of the representative A. Oops, what happened? Um, so, so that will enter into your, um, uh, so that will be your normalization constant. And I defined it like that, one of the square root of N. <clears throat> so when you make the basis, you, you have to store the list of your representatives and you know that it represents that that sum uh, and it's useful to store these periodicities as well because they they enter in in the, uh, you know further along in the calculation all right so let, let's see how you compute the hamiltonian in uh, in this basis <clears throat> and, and let's look at this heisenberg chain that i i, I defined before <clears throat> So now, you know, we just have to act with the Hamiltonian on, on, on this state. Uh, and uh, H is uh, a, a sum. Uh, let's see, H. So, you know, here I should also have written H is a sum of H, J, because I, I defined some things here. I defined H naught is the full diagonal part of, of the Hamiltonian. And H, J is just, you know, one one of these spin flipping uh, terms <clears throat> so the hamiltonian is the sum over all you know uh, this j goes from zero to to n basically uh, so h 
commutes with T. So when I have my momentum state, I can take H past the translation operator, right? Uh, and then I can write as I as I do here uh, at that stage H as a sum over these uh, smaller operators that I have defined. And now we just have to see what what those do when they act on A. Okay, the diagonal case is easy. You just have to uh, you know compute the diagonal part of the energy in um, in that state. Uh, you know just based on the bits. Uh, bit representation of A, you can compute uh, that number. <clears throat> uh, but for the off diagonals, you will flip some bits, which means that A changes, right? It becomes another state. Uh, and you know what, what will happen is that that state that you get should also you know correspond to some part of a momentum state, uh, but it will not necessarily be that when you flip two spins in A that you get one of the representatives that you stored, but you will get some translation of some representative that you stored. So if I define <clears throat> LJ as a number of translations, then it will be true that you know H acting on A will be some of your one of your representatives, but potentially translated by some steps that I call T to the minus L J for uh, convenience, and that L J you have to find. <clears throat> so basically, you will flip the spins, and then you will you know start to translate it and look in your list, and you know there's some effic efficient ways to do that. I will not talk about those details, uh, but you will look in your list until you find uh, uh, you know, some representative that equals you know, whatever that was. <clears throat> so that means uh, you know, H times that state, I could have said A of K here, I should. Uh, no, sorry, that, that I, I did that here, right, A of K. Uh, so you know, we just put in that, result instead of hj and then it uh, it looks like that <clears throat> so it looks like a bunch of momentum states almost except that you have this uh, you know shift in in uh, uh, in the number of translations which if you just do some relabeling relabeling of this sum you will uh, translate that into uh, just a phase shift as we similar to what we did before <clears throat> So uh, you know, if you look at uh, you know the uh, the whole H uh, on on um, on that momentum state, uh, when I relabel my summation, uh, I, I get T R back here, and then I get a phase out of the whole thing. And what's left is equivalent to one of these other momentum states, uh, you know, based on on the B J representative, but <clears throat> because the normalizations are potentially different here because these states can have uh, different periodicities, there will be some some uh, factor in, in front to account for, for the normalizations. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So, so now you can extract the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, which is what you need. So this was just the Hamiltonian uh, acting on a state. You got a bunch of you know other momentum states so then you just take the overlap with some some uh, uh, state with the same momentum right uh, the, the Hamiltonian conserves the momentum so we, we we can only consider momentum or matrix elements with the same momentum state <clears throat> for the diagonal part uh, which well I should maybe not have used j as the summation here but the di diagonal part was j equals zero so then it was the case where you know, we just have to compute uh, the energy. So that matrix element is, of course, just uh, just that diagonal part. <clears throat> and from the other ones, you see that you know the only state that produces any overlap is that B J of K, whatever that was that you got by flipping two spins. So for each uh, J, 
you know, uh, in the Hamiltonian, you got uh, one momentum state that overlaps with, with that. And it's just uh, uh, this complex phase times a number which just has to do with this potentially different normalization. So <clears throat> I think this is not, not so surprising that you get at least the, the phase here, right? But the phase depends on, on, on uh, you know, how, how that state is related to one of, of your representatives. So you cannot say, you know, a priori what LJ is. You, you really just have to search for, for it in a list. Okay, so is, is that sort of clear what's, what's going on here? Yeah. In the end of the day, I would say that I, well, to really construct the basis, you know, in principle, it takes two to the n uh, steps. So, you know, that's exponential. So I guess in in some sense, that's the, the more time consuming part. Un, until you reach very large n, which you cannot even do in practice, I think, you know, the diagonalization will be more expensive in spite of that. And by the way, you know, to, to construct uh, uh, the basis by, you know, successively, you know, generating all these two to the n states and checking their magnetization and, you know, uh, doing all these things with periodicities and so on. <clears throat> that can be done either in some sort of trivial way, or it could be done in a more sophisticated way that would, you know, scale less bad. Well, but actually what I said was, was wrong. Okay, so it takes exponential time to construct the basis. But to diagonalize the matrix is that exponential, you know, cubed more or less, right? So, so, so it is the diagonalization that kills you in the end. And the storage possibly. That, that's great. Oh yeah, we, I will get to that point. So yeah, yeah. So uh, I will uh, uh, discuss a couple of other conservation laws, and finally I will, I will get to the total spin that I think you are uh, uh, calling for, right? <laughs> which turns out to be more difficult. <clears throat> okay. Any, any other question? All right. So now we have used two conservation laws, although I haven't shown you the details, but we we can. When we construct the momentum states, we can limit, you know, these representatives that we uh, that we start from there. We can, of course, limit them to just uh, states out of a block of fixed m. So if you do that, you get all the momentum states of that fixed m block, and you can make your Hamiltonian matrix, and now you can diagonalize it <clears throat> and and calculate whatever matrix elements you like. But let me talk about another symmetry, and this is. Uh, at least I find it at least slightly amusing what happens here. You know, we can also use reflection symmetry, right? You can, on this uh, periodic ring, you can define, you know, reflections about, you know, some, some line that you draw through sides or through bonds. It doesn't really matter, but you can use one such uh, reflection. Maybe, let's see, well, it it's almost looks like you cannot, uh, because, you know, from your well, let's see, show you first how I define it here. So here I just define <clears throat> the reflection, you know, you may call it parity operator, uh, as just, uh, you know, changing n, uh, changing the index to n minus the index plus one. So it's almost like, you know, just reverse the whole uh, whole uh, string of, of spins. That's my, my simple choice. Uh, okay, so, you know, your Hamiltonian would typically commute with this, P, right? At least the, 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 the Heisenberg chain that I showed you, any, any uniform uh, you know, model would commute with P. So, so you can definitely diagonalize H and P uh, together, but it doesn't look like, <coughs> uh, 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 like P and T uh, commute, right? They, uh, well, I guess you, you know it from, <laughs> from, from, from what you know about physics, but you know, if you, if you doubt just write down some something for a small chain and just do it you know do a translation and a reflection or then do the reflection and the translation you will not get the same same thing right so <clears throat> they they do not commute so then it looks like we should not be able to diagonalize h and t 
and uh, you know which is you know momentum states and uh, and and p at the same same time right because these three uh, all don't commute but uh, let's see if that is actually true and so first let me <clears throat> propose a way to to construct the momentum state uh, which also has a, a given parity and let's see if if it works out so in the same way as as when we do momentum uh, the momentum basis we do all the translations of the states because of course uh, uh, you know the, 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 that's what what momentum is the generator of, of translations so now we can also say okay let's also add up uh, all you know both uh, reflection uh, you know members of, of the state so <clears throat> what I mean here is that you know p is, is that operator here so now I have this sum over the translations of the state but now I, I don't translate my just my uh, original basis state but I do one plus p little p is a number plus minus one you, you would imagine of course that you know the eigenvalues of p are plus or minus one uh, and then the operator that does the reflection uh, like that so I translate a state and its reflection at the same time uh, so uh, let, let's see if uh, if that's uh, uh, an eigenstate of of both uh, t and and p <clears throat> so th this for sure has momentum k because if i you know translate the state and check that i get this phase uh, outside it doesn't really matter what state i translate so you know if it's a representative or anything else that i translate we can just check uh, check that as the, in the same way as we did before so it definitely has momentum k uh, you know, because I wrote the translation operator before this, I could also have put the translation operator there. Then you would have to 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 worry about the commutation of t uh, t and, and p and so on. But but if you just check the momentum, this is definitely a momentum state with momentum k. But is it a parity state with with parity p? Okay, let, let's just uh, try it. <clears throat> so we we act with p uh, on this state. Uh, and now you have to use this thing, which I will not prove to you, but again, if you just draw a little uh, uh, graph, you will see that it's true that P times T to the R is actually T to the minus R times P. I don't know if you have encountered this in <clears throat> in some other context, but it's very easy to, uh, to see that that's the, the case. So when I act with P here, when I do, you know, take my P, past the T operator, it becomes T to the minus R. And then, you know, instead of one here, I just leave P and then P squared is of course one. So I, I'm just left with the little P here. So this is what happened when I, when I uh, reflected my momentum state. <clears throat> now you can just pull a, a P outside. So, so then you are, since again, I'm using P squared equals one. So then you can, uh, I, I guess I switched the order, but you get, can write this as one times P, P, right? You get a P in front there and there you get one. And now P is in front. Uh, okay, so then the question is, is that P times, uh, you know, my original state? Well, it actually is in a, in a special case because you see this looks, almost uh, like what I what I started from here right uh, I have the same thing here here but the phase here is different here I had minus and here I have plus uh, but if k is zero or k is pi that doesn't it, the sign doesn't matter right <clears throat> so for those special momenta uh, I can actually use uh, p in other words although P, uh, P and T don't commute in general. P and T do commute, you know, when they act only in the space of, uh, you know, momentum zero or, or pi. Uh, so, so, so this is of some relevance when you do uh, your, you know, exact diagonalization because often the ground state is the zero momentum, you know, sector. And then since you can also use P, you can split that block into two and then it's, you can do maybe one or two more spins, which seems <laughs> insignificant, but you know, in some cases it can be <clears throat> be useful. Uh, so uh, th that was the, the point here. 
uh, that for those special momenta, you know, in, in addition, you, you split uh, the, the momentum block. For, for the other case states, you simply cannot use parity in this way. Uh, but, um, well, so let me also say, you know, this is physically clear from the beginning, right? Because on the lattice, you know, minus K is K for K equals zero or, or, or pi, right? So uh, it turns out you can actually exploit uh, parity in a different way, but I will not discuss it, but I gave some, you know, reference in, in my, my description of, of these uh, lectures where, where that is uh, discussed in some long lecture notes that I wrote a few years ago. <clears throat> so that's something uh, we can call semi-momentum states, which is basically a way to not further block diagonalize with P, but one can actually use it to make a, a real basis. You know, the momentum basis is complex. So when you work with it in the computer, you have to work with complex numbers. Uh, but you can actually exploit parity in a way uh, to make the basis completely real, which is also, you know, of some advantage. You know, operations on real uh, numbers are, are faster, right? But let, let me not discuss uh, that here. It's not really so important. Oh, but let me discuss one other. <clears throat> symmetry. Often we have, you know, spin inversion symmetry, which is, you know, defined in this obvious way here. Here I just flip all, all my spins. So that is often a symmetry also in, in models where you don't conserve the magnetization. For example, in, in, uh, in the transverse field icing model that I mentioned, you know, the icing model with an uh, uh, SX uh, uh, sum added to it. Uh, that has this kind of uh, spin reflection symmetry. So it can be useful uh, in that context. Uh, so now what you can do, you can, uh, let's say we have the case where we can also, you know, use P and we can use uh, momentum states. So my momentum is zero or pi. Then I just uh, add another, uh, you know, uh, sum over uh, spin inversion here at the end. Then you can proceed as before and show that it's a momentum state. You can proceed as before and show that it's a, it's a, a, a parity eigenstate. And it's very easy to see, you know, I will not even do it, but it's, this is almost completely trivial because there are no, you know, there's no phase. It's just plus or minus one. So you can, uh, and it commutes with, with all these other things, right? The spin inversion commutes with P, uh, with T and everything. <clears throat> so you can easily show that that's the case. So this starts to look bad, but remember that in the end, you know, to, to represent this whole mess of a state, I only need to store that uh, representative state A, which is an integer if I use the uh, bit representation uh, of this. And as you saw with the Hamiltonian, eventually, you know, we got the Hamiltonian matrix elements, uh, you know, can sort of be, be uh, pre-calculated. Let me or at least, you know, we don't finally need a, a sum for that. I mean, the matrix elements <clears throat> only require these uh, stored numbers here. And this is something that you have to, to, to find, but you see there's no big summation here anymore. And it's the same with, with P and uh, Z as, as well, uh, that, you know, it, it, uh, the, the matrix element is still, you know, basically of, of that uh, that form. Um, all right. So so now let me give you uh, just some examples to show you how how, how quickly it goes uh, bad. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know the the matrix size that you would have to to multiply. So now I show you an example here of uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know different system sizes. And this is for, you know, typically the, the fully symmetric uh, sector is always uh, where, where the ground state lives, meaning momentum zero, magnetization zero. Well, not always, but in this case, if I don't have a, a mag external magnetic field, you know, clearly, uh, almost obviously, the magnetization will be zero in the ground state. And also, uh, you know, with, with, with the parity and, and spin reflection, the, the biggest, well, the ground state is normally in the symmetric block. And those are also the, uh, the biggest blocks. So here I, I just show the block size for, for this magnetization and this momentum, but for the different combinations of, 
of uh, P and Z. So now you can see if we just focus on the small systems first that the blocks are of different size. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, uh, uh, you know, even with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, parity, for example, if you reflect the state, you know, some states come back to themselves and then P cannot be minus one, right? Because if you, if you hear, you know, you take this, this state A, and you reflect it and, and little p is minus one, then if the reflected state is the same as the state itself, again, you just get zero. So that state doesn't exist. <clears throat> so that's why these, uh, these blocks, uh, you know, will be in general of, uh, of different size. And it turns out for n equals eight, there's not even a single state in, in this block with p minus one uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the spin reflection uh, plus one. So it can also happen, of course, when you spin reflect and uh, uh, spatially reflect that you get the same state. So again, you cannot have minus. <clears throat> okay, but the, the relative difference in the block size will, will basically diminish as you increase the system size. And you see that this block, so this is the number of states in, in, in these blocks with these quantum numbers. For 32, you know, the block size is about 4.7 million. So you, there's no way you can fully diagonalize that matrix. On a <clears throat> big computer these days, you can fully diagonalize. Well, I, I guess it should be possible with 24, but not with 28. I think even, even you know, tens of thousands for a full diagonalization on a modern computer is not, uh, is not easy actually. So this, this shows you what the difficulties are. <clears throat> okay, now to uh, Slava's question here, uh, uh, S squared, you know, the total spin. So, you know, the <clears throat> first we can note that the total spin looks uh, a little bit like the Heisenberg interaction itself. We can, uh, you know, sum up all the spins and square, it's like a sum of <laughs> Heisenberg interactions. Uh, uh, but it's actually, the eigenstates of total spin actually are, are very complicated. It's uh, really not something you even want to do. So normally, uh, you know, people don't use uh, total S uh, conservation. There's actually one way to do it, which later on, I, I think I will maybe have time to talk about uh, the valence bond basis a little bit so I can actually <clears throat> construct uh, singlet states uh, in the valence bond basis. But Still, it, it, uh, the Hamiltonian becomes very messy in, in that basis. So typically it's not used. <clears throat> so spin reflection is, you know, contains some aspect of, uh, of the total spin. So it turns out, uh, for example, if, if uh, the total spin is even, you know, zero, if I, okay, by my number N, I assume it is even my number of spins. So then the total spin can be, you know, uh, it's always an integer. Uh, and it turns out that if it's even, then the spin re reflection uh, is always, uh, you know, plus the Z uh, quantum number is plus. If S is odd, it, it's uh, minus. Uh, <clears throat> that, that's just a fact. I forgot how to prove that, but it's something very sim simple if I remember correctly. All right, so. Uh, uh, Anders? Yeah. Is it a good time to stop? Oh, or, yeah, okay. Break? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good time. To, yeah. yeah. All right. So let, let's have a 15 minute break. Okay. Uh, so welcome back. So, w one thing that I forgot to say about this, uh, you know, sp total spin operator. So, I, I mentioned it look, looks uh, really like the Heisenberg interaction itself. And, and even though we don't, uh, you know, use it to block and diagonalize the Hamiltonian, often we, of course, want to know what the total spin of a state is. And then we just have to calculate it. So, then we compute the matrix for S squared, which is done uh, really exactly in the same way uh, as I explained you do the Hamiltonian. You have your, you know, uh, momentum states, whatever, just compute the uh, matrix elements. And, you know, it's just that it's like a, a Heisenberg interaction with long range interactions, right? All to all 
that's what the total spin, of course, uh, you know, can be written as. And, uh, you know, I equals J thing just gives a constant. So, so I will show an example of that as an observable, you know, that when I talk about the, the next topic here. <clears throat> so, you know, as I mentioned, and you saw in this list of states, the matrices become too large. You, you really cannot even store them, right? If you have a, uh, you know, so really huge matrices, even the storage is a problem. So uh, you know, then as a, as a, another way to to uh, proceed is to say, okay, let's say we are just happy to get the ground state, or uh, and uh, you know maybe a few low lying excitations. Then we can use uh, you know not full diagonalization, but another you know class of met methods that are often uh, you know called Krylov space uh, uh, methods and. Uh, you know, normally the Hamiltonian is actually sparse, so we can actually store the Hamiltonian in some uh, efficient way. By sparse, I of course mean that it's mainly zeros. So you can see that in the Heisenberg interaction, when I <clears throat> act on a state, I, I either get the same state, you know, if I think about one of these original basis states or, or representatives, I, I flip two spins or, you know, which I can do in n different ways at most. You can of course flip them only if they are anti-parallel. So for a given you know basis state, you can connect at most n other states. So the, the you know out of you know some exponentially big number. <clears throat> so the matrix is very sparse. So let me not discuss how to distort it, but you can uh, imagine that you only store the non-zero elements in some smart way. Okay, so then the storage is not really a problem in the end, uh, but but the diagonalization is. So let me talk about these Krylov space methods where you can reach uh, you know very large Hilbert spaces. Although you know large Hilbert space still means a pretty small uh, spin system. <clears throat> so what is the Krylov space? Well, it's sort of not a unique uh, state in the sense that it's defined uh, with respect to some pretty much arbitrary uh, state. So you can even pick like a random state. Uh, in, in whatever basis you are uh, working. Uh, so you make a vector, uh, which is of the size of your, your basis and just put some random numbers there. That, that would be one way. In principle, you could start from some good variational state or something, but it really doesn't make a big difference. And then you construct the Krylov space by uh, acting with powers of the Hamiltonian uh, on, on that state. Uh, but, but before, uh, you know, discussing what the whole Krylov space is, let me just say uh, you know, how you can project out the ground state by just acting with a large power of, of, of H. So if this lambda here becomes very large, then this will actually be proportional to the ground state. And uh, you know maybe you have seen this before. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's very easy to see because, okay, uh, you can expand this state in your basis, right? So then there are the energy eigenvalues, you get them to that power. And these, these are just the, you know, whatever expansion coefficients there are. You don't know them, but you know that they have some values. <clears throat> and then let's pull out, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, factor uh, in front of the ground state. So here I, I, I ref zero refers to the ground state, one, the state with the next highest energy and so on. So then you get just C naught times your ground state there. And then in, in all these other ones, you get powers of ratios of, uh, uh, of energies. And now you can uh, uh, always, you know, if need be, you can add a, you know, a, a constant to the Hamiltonian. Uh, you can, so, so that these ratios will always, always be less than one. That's, that's always possible because, you know, you have a, <clears throat> lowest uh, energy, which you know typically would be negative, and you have some highest energy, and you would like to make sure that the lowest energy has the largest magnitude. So you may have to shift, you know, if this is like a hundred and that this is minus ten, that's not good. Then you will shift it so that, so that this is like a uh, minus hundred and this is you know something else, right? So that the 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 ground state is the lowest in uh, highest in in magnitude. And then all these uh, ratios will be you know less than one, and then of course if lambda is is very big, you know all those uh, uh, contributions from the excited states are filtered out. So so that's that in itself is a way to just get the ground state, and it's it's pretty easy to do because 
you know, just acting with a sparse matrix, meaning one that you have stored in some compact form without the zeros, just acting on some, uh, uh, you know, basis or, or some state vector uh, is, is, it doesn't, uh, it's not that bad, you know, matrix times vector takes off the order of M squared operations if M is the size of, of the basis. <clears throat> so, so that's an often used uh, uh, method to get the ground state. But you can do even better if you actually uh, uh, construct like a, a small basis that doesn't just con continue this, uh, contain this last state that you con constructed, but you, you, you uh, construct uh, you know, a basis that, you know, for, that contains the lambda equals zero, one, two, three, up to some, you know, value that could be of the order hundreds or something like that. <clears throat> and that is a, you know, non, uh, unnormalized, non-orthogonal basis, but you can orthogon orthonormalize the basis. So since, uh, uh, since we know that if lambda is large, you know, that, you know, last state that you would add to your basis should already be a pretty good approximation to your ground state, right? But then you can imagine that if you add some, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of optimal superposition of those states, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, that could be a better state than just the last one, right? So, so you, you, you get, as lambda increases, or, or when I construct these states from n equals zero to, to lambda, these h to the m states, <clears throat> you get closer and closer to the ground state. Uh, and by forming a linear combination, you know, that linear combination can be even closer to the ground state and often dramatically so. You know, it, it, it's hard to say in general uh, how much, but the thing is, it's pretty easy to do that. And you also then get some excitation. So you can get the whole uh, low-lying spectrum by doing that in a way which I will demonstrate. <clears throat> so. Uh, well, you know, I guess the th that's right, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I guess they will also be controlled by the gaps, but you see, it, it also depends a little bit on what state you you start from, it, it's not uh, unique. So you can, you can just say the following, you take two states that are close to the ground state. So each of them are, you know, have some, let's say uh, expectation value of the energy, which is not quite the ground state energy, but, <clears throat> but close to, you know, if you take uh, the optimal linear combination of them, you always do better than any of the two individually, right? That, that's all, always uh, the case. And exactly how much that helps I don't think that there's any general, uh, you know, statement. Well, maybe if you, you know, look carefully, you can say something. <clears throat> but I will show, you know, what happens in 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 practice. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. So, so that that's what we will get to. So this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you would have to find the best uh, coefficients here, right? So you don't know what what they will be. And furthermore, you know, uh, we, we, we haven't, uh, uh, you know, uh, we want the basis to be orthogonal also, right? <clears throat> you know, you actually don't necessarily have to work in an orthogonal basis, but everything is much easier. So you can imagine, you know, you get a bunch of vectors, you could do some Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization or something like that, but there's a much better way. And that's what, what's called uh, uh, the Lanchos method. And there are actually, you know, other methods, maybe some even better than the Lanchos method, but the Lanchos is sort of the most, well, uh, uh, easiest to explain and the most often used uh, in, in, in our community. Uh, but then the, the point is that you, you, you make this basis, you know, uh, 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 using such states, and then you just want to diagonalize H in that truncated basis, right? So it, it can be a severely truncated basis because typically maybe you are, or let's say in some case, maybe you have tens of millions of basis states, <clears throat> but this kind of scheme may only need like a hundred of these 
Krylov space vectors to give you an excellent energy. Okay. So, so that can uh, you, you circumvent the whole uh, you know diagonalization of, of of a big matrix. You only have to diagonalize. You have to make this basis, and you have to uh, diagonalize uh, H in that basis. <clears throat> and it turns out that in in this Lanchos basis that I will talk about, H it has even a very simple form. It's actually a tri-diagonal matrix, which means that it has the non zeros and the diagonals and the two you know sub diagonals. That's not really so important when it comes to diagonalizing it, but it makes it very convenient to, to work with. <clears throat> so let, let's see how we make that basis. Uh, so first you just pick an arbitrary uh, uh, you know, vector. Uh, so you have H, think of H as a matrix and you have a basis. So you have state vectors of some, some size and they can be big, maybe millions of, of uh, elements. Now we just generate one at completely at random, for example. <clears throat> so I will first construct a basis which is orthogonal but not normalized. This is normal. Normally, the way it's done, uh, one can do it in some other way too. But let me discuss uh, this way. So the first one. Um, well, so first let me do some definitions. So I will in. in uh, introduce some coefficients which later on you will use to normalize. So this is just the, uh, the overlap of a state with itself uh, out of these states that you will construct. And then we have the matrix elements of H, uh, the diagonal ones uh, in, in that basis. Those I will need for, for this construction. <clears throat> so now I will start with one state that you take completely random. So you can use your random number generator in the computer to put some um, uh, whatever elements in your uh, vector that I call F0. Uh, and then you construct the next one by this simple operation. You, you act with your Hamiltonian of a, uh, on F0. So basically take your matrix times a vector, but the matrix is stored in a compact form. So it's, it's not using the you know, full uh, time consuming uh, rules of, of matrix multiplication is something that uh, scales a bit better than that although it still takes time that's the dominant part of, of the computational effort <clears throat> but then you subtract some some fraction of your uh, you know previous uh, vector as well in such a way that these states f0 and f1 are orthogonal to each other so then you just have to say okay what what should uh, a naught B for that orthogonality to hold. You just put in the expression for F1 and compute it. And you see that if A naught is H naught naught, which was this you know, diagonal like, uh, element of H divided by the number N uh, naught, which is defined like that. Okay, now you have two uh, orthogonal states. Uh, and then it turns out that for all the subsequent states, there's a very simple rule, which is just marginally more complicated than this one. Namely, if you have states up to M, 0, 1, 2, up to some M, then the F M plus one state is constructed in the following way. Multiply H into the F M, subtract some you know, fraction of, of, of that previous state and subtract some pr uh, fraction of the next uh, you know, previous state, the one previous to M, M meaning M minus one. <clears throat> and, uh, and then you can check, uh, this is, you know, just make sure that this one is, uh, you know, diagonal to all previous ones. It turns out that, uh, that it will be uh, as long as, uh, as these uh, coefficients are chosen in this way, which just depend on, uh, on, on these numbers that you, you, you have uh, stored at that point. <clears throat> okay, so this is actually very easy to prove, but let me not do it. It's sort of a recursive uh, proof. If you say, okay, you, you have done it up to some M now, uh, you know, assuming that, you know, all of them uh, are uh, orthogonal to each other up to uh, some M. And you know, you know, by very simple construction that it was, true for you know f0 and f1 and then you know just based on those recursive you can say okay fm plus one then you just 
uh, do it like that, and you can you can uh, uh, easily see that it will be uh, be be true for uh, that it's orthogonal to all the previous ones. All right. So so then you have. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when, when you have gone as, as high as you like, maybe m equals 100 or something like that, um, uh, then you, you have your basis. And, and now, you know, the basis is or, orthogonal, but it's still not uh, uh, normalized. Um, so but let, let's first discuss the, the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian before we normalize, and then we will uh, normalize. It will be very easy. So what, what about H acting on Fm, you know, from which we can construct uh, the Hamiltonian matrix? Uh, and then you just take the formula on the previous page. Maybe I should already remind you what that was. Uh, uh, take this formula. And now you, you see you can express H Fm, but you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, just express that one in terms of, of these and, and plus those, right? So, so what is uh, uh, HFM? It's really that just that formula. Uh, it, it looks like that. <clears throat> so that's now uh, you know uh, you, you have HFM already. And now you just take the overlap with all all uh, other M, and because we we have constructed it in an or orthogonal way, you know that the overlap with you know with these we will all vanish. So the only ones that su survive will be uh, uh, the ones that, uh, uh, you know, where, where, where if, if I take the overlap here with Fm minus one, then I get, get this one, B minus one, um, and, and so on. So I, I only get uh, non-zero matrix elements for a given Fm with, you know, three other uh, ones, <clears throat> M minus one, M and M plus one. So that means that the matrix is tri-diagonal, right? This is the uh, diagonal, and these are the, the sub-diagonals. Uh, and why do we get this NM? Well, that, that's how NM was defined, right? It was the overlap of a state with itself. Like here you get AM uh, and FM overlapping with itself. So that's, that was the de definition of, of NM. <clears throat> but of course, we want the Hamiltonian in the normalized basis. But you know, these NMs, they are the normalization uh, constants basically. So, so these states, uh, which I call phi m, are, are now normalized. Uh, and then, of course, it's easy to see from this. You just divide by, uh, by uh, you know, uh, uh, nm basically and take the square root to get the uh, uh, you get get the matrix elements in this basis, right? <clears throat> so. Uh, let's see, uh, where did the square root come from? I'm slightly confused. Uh, so you have to divide by n m. Uh, now, as, does anybody see now where the square root comes from? I, I'm pretty sure it's there, but I, well, I'm completely sure it should be there, but now I, uh, I, I just somehow don't see it. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, let, let's let's not worry about it. You, you had the uh, normalization factor, and you have the elements in the unnormalized basis, so it should be easy to uh, to 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 get these matrix elements. So that's now a, a tridiagonal matrix. It doesn't matter so much at this stage that it is tridiagonal, but the point is that it can be a pretty small basis compared to you know the whole uh, uh, basis uh, size. Uh, so, like I said, typically maybe 100 or 200 states. You will see some example in a moment. <clears throat> uh, okay, and then you know the, the the point is that you know if you diagonalize in that basis, you get a good approximation not only to the ground state but to typically several low lying states. So these linear combinations of states in the Krylov basis. They also can, uh, you know, come close to to the excited states. Um, right. So, how about uh, uh, <clears throat> some operator expectation values? So now, you know, we we 
uh, we have many bases going on uh, at the same time here. So that's why this can be a little bit confusing. So first we have what I call the computational basis, which was ju just this, you know, up and down spins that we uh, refer to with the bits in the integer. And then from that, we constructed some basis, uh, you know, of momentum states and possibly, you know, magnetization conservation and so on. So, so those representative states, you know, refer to some, uh, you know, potentially complicated basis with many conserved quantum numbers. And now we have yet another uh, basis. We have, uh, you know, the Lanchos basis, which are linear combinations. Uh, the Lanchos basis states are linear combinations of those big vectors. And now we have, uh, you know, a bunch of those big vectors, which we call our Lanchos basis, and we have diagonalized the Hamiltonian in that basis. So you see that there are sort of uh, many bases that you have to keep in your head at the same time. <clears throat> yeah, please. Uh huh. Okay, you know, with, with symmetry breaking, when we work with a finite system, even if you have symmetry breaking in the thermodynamic limit, unless you add some symmetry breaking fields, your finite systems will not break the symmetry. So, so you will not detect symmetry breaking in that way. So when we talk about, um, well, even today I will show, you know, so instead of computing the order parameters, you, you uh, will compute squared order parameters, right? So they, they will, uh, you know, tell you something, even if the symmetry is not broken, right? Um, so we will we will talk a bit more about that. So yeah, so I mean we 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 can use you know the, this calculation for that, but the the problem is is again that the systems are very small. But I will sh show you some examples. Maybe I have time uh, today, or, or it may be tomorrow. Uh, yeah. So so now you know uh, when you diagonalize your your tri-diagonal Lanchos you know matrix, you get eigenvectors and energies and your energies are if if this lambda is good enough should be good approximations to your your actual low energy spectrum and uh, and these eigenvectors uh you know now if you want to actually compute some observables which you have expressed in your uh you know not in 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 the lanchos basis but in this previous basis then you just have to to transform to to that basis so so, so a state that you want to compute some expectation value in would be of this form where these Vns are, are these uh, eigenvectors. So if you want the, uh, uh, you know, ground state, you would, would use the first, uh, you know, basis uh, vector. And this A, <coughs> uh, you know, here can go from one to M, right? So you will get, uh, and M is is the, well. Let's see now. Uh, yeah, so that's that's your uh, your uh, original basis uh, size, and lambda is, is the uh, the Lanchos uh, basis size. Right. So you transform back to uh, from that basis, and then you can compute <laughs> any anything you like, basically in 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 that basis. Now let let's look at at some typical convergence here. So now this shows a. Uh, a case of a 24 site uh, uh, chain with some particular quantum numbers where the block size is not huge, but you know, still you know, pretty big 28,000 something. Uh, and now, again, we in, in the Lanchos basis construction, we start with a random state, really completely random elements uh, in, in the vector of this size m. Uh, and now, as a function of increasing lambda. I, I, so for, for each value of lambda, I, I diagonalized uh, uh, this ma matrix of size, let's say 20 by 20 here, 30 by 30 and so on. Uh, and then you see that these are the four <coughs> lowest states I, I got. And you see how, how quickly the, the ground state converged here. Even after only 10 states, you have a very good ground state. The, the higher, states converge a little bit slower, but also uh, pretty well. And this is a variational approach. So the energies always converge from above, which is, which is a, a good thing. <clears throat> but you know, it, it should be kept in mind that 
Uh, other quantities don't necessarily converge uh, monotonically. So here I show you know, the spin quantum number, which again, uh, uh, I, I compute the expectation value of S squared, which should be S times S plus one if it's an eigenstate of S. <clears throat> and you see that these, these uh, four states here, uh, initially, you know, this S that you get from that is not an integer, which means of course that you know, they are not uh, spin, total spin eigenstates. Uh, but eventually they converge, but sometimes in a non-monotonic fashion to uh, integer values. So in this case, <clears throat> uh, you know, either uh, zero or two. So this is related to what I told you before. If the spin reflection quantum number is one, then the total spin must be actually even, right? Okay, so uh, I don't know if that really answers your question from some theoretical perspective, but at least, uh, you know, in practice, you know, this this works. And, you know, this Lanchus method and, and uh, other methods, you know, there's a huge uh, applied math literature on them. So I, I suspect that your uh, question is probably, you know, answered in some way in, in the more, you know, math uh, literature, but I'm not really familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely and you know this will be next so very good point because you know this proof of orthogonality that's of course you know a, a mathematical statement but like you say in in the computer we have a finite precision so at some point these states that should be orthogonal to each other are no longer completely orthogonal to each other and when they start to be you know noticeably non-orthogonal to each other that non-orthogonality just escalates and something actually very funny happens i, I think i included that here yeah may i ask another <clears throat> question yeah so the value of lambda where you reach the plateau yeah right, uh, does it scale with m with the size of the lattice? Or? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Good point. So, you know, if, if the lattice is is bigger, you know, uh, lambda also has to be bigger. But it doesn't normally, maybe linearly or something like that. It's a bit hard to say because, again, it depends on how the gaps scale, right? Um, but, uh, you know, in, in some sense, the convergence is, you know, in some sort of hand-waving sense, set by how fast information can spread you know when you act with the hamiltonian you know you you act something on nearest neighbors so you can imagine that you know some uh, uh you know spin flips converge in with some sort of light cone if you think of this each action of h almost like a time step <clears throat> so so roughly i guess you could say that well you need at least of the order of the system size steps for this you know whatever you call it uh, information spreading or scrambling but it's like almost in inverse scrambling right uh, for that to take place <clears throat> that can actually be shown uh, and, and i do this in my my uh, class back home uh, when i teach computational physics if you just do a very simple problem you just do one uh, particle in you do the particle in a box but on a on a on a grid and let's say you do it in 2d so you start with a particle in the in the middle as your initial state and then you do the lanchos procedure then you can see that the wave function sort of spreads out you know from the center and each you know time meaning each successive basis state it can only spread out by one more step because you know the hamiltonian only hops the particle one one uh, lattice spacing at a time if you do the discrete uh, uh, kinetic energy <clears throat> so it spreads out and so you need of the order of you know how many pixels you have in your uh, box so it's like a particle in a box but on a lattice right? so there you can really argue that well it's this uh, hamiltonian is sort of uh, spreading out particle every time it acts and it should be something similar here but now <clears throat> here the basis state the basis size is very large but the spatial system size is very small and this information spreading has to do with the the spatial uh, uh, 
you know, spreading of spin flips and so on. But uh, roughly, I think, proportional to to uh, L, but it probably depends on the dynamic exponent, right? If the gap scale like one over L to some Z, you know, maybe you, you, you also need a number of steps going like L to the Z, so something like that. <clears throat> but this is something that in practice, you always need to, to just uh, uh, check it. So should we stop a quarter two or what is the, I forget what, we, we started a bit late, I think, yeah. Uh, so let me talk about the non-orthogonality. That's also a bit uh, interesting. So eventually, indeed, uh, it breaks down uh, for large, uh, you know, here I say a little m, you know, maybe I should have said lambda. Uh, it actually causes, it, it doesn't necessarily ruin your complete calculation. If you want the ground state, it's actually completely fine. Let me, uh, this sort of showed up in the wrong order. What you get is that the, the excitation sort of collapse onto each other. So roughly you see here as a function of lambda, now it's for, for some uh, uh, even, even smaller uh, size. Now I forgot why is this worse. Well, because I, I go to, for the, the small size to converge, I, I didn't need to go as, as large as I got, did here in, in lambda. But you see here the, the ground state, the black one, you know, always stays like that. But the first excitation at some point, uh, non-orthogonality kicks in and then the, the whole uh, uh, scheme, you know, the first excited state gets contaminated by the ground state and then that ground state completely takes over because it wants to project it to, <laughs> to, to, to the ground state. And if there is some component of the ground state in it, it will do that. If it's completely orthogonal, of course it cannot because there's no component of the ground state uh, in it. But but this happens very suddenly. So you know it looks completely fine, and then suddenly, in, you know, a few steps, uh, the the first excitation just collapses onto. But then you see that all those other states also collapse <laughs> at the same time. Sometimes it's not like all of them at the same time, but you have these uh, you know collapses happening here. But if you are interested in the ground state, it's fine. Even if you are interested in excited state, it's fine. It's just that your second you know, state may actually be a copy of the ground state. And if you want the first excitation, you actually have to go to the third state like here, but eventually that also collapses. So you, know, you, you just have to see if some collapse has happened or you can do some explicit reorthogonalization. So let me not, not demonstrate this, but after, each uh, you know uh, uh, step, you you uh, manually orthogonalize to all the previous ones, which you can do with this formula. Uh, then it's fine. But the drawback of, of that is that then you also need to store all the previous states. I, I forgot to mention before that you can do this whole Lanchos procedure in principle without storing all the the uh, you know Lanchos vectors that you construct. You only need you know, sort in a sort of floating way uh, store three of them then you can you know diagonalize the matrix and so on now to, to compute physical observables you of course need all of them but if you don't have if you're not able to store all these vectors because they are large you can also do this you know basis transformation back to your original basis sort of on the fly you you start the basis construction one more time uh, you know, uh, uh, at the same time as you evaluate the sum over uh, over basis vector. So, <clears throat> so that you can. So, if you want to, or to uh, uh, manually orthogonalize, you really have to store all of them, as far as I can tell. Uh, and then, you know, you, you see that it uh, it, it works. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's see if it's. Uh, uh, you know, in some sense, I think it would be better to con continue tomorrow now I can take some questions and because now uh, it's uh, I want to start to show you what we can do with this kind of method and method and in fact the illustration I will do which is for this Heisenberg chain there is some connection to uh, conformal field theory in, in that so you know maybe you will enjoy that but I think it's better I just start that from uh, tomorrow so any questions Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, so, was that a question or a statement? 
Oh, uh, okay. Like I said in the beginning, in principle, you could start if you have a good ansatz what the state is, then it should converge even faster, right? So, so, so you you, you probably shouldn't start, uh, you know, optimally in a, in a random state in that case. But you know, since this whole procedure is not really that well, let's say that you save. Uh, uh, you know, some lambda with that instead of converging, let's say at 20, maybe you converge at, uh, you know, 10 or something like that. Well, then the calculation is twice as fast, but, you know, it's not exponentially better. You know, it's, um, it may help, but it may not help very much. And then you have to figure out what your variation of starting point is, or, or what would you suggest to take for the starting point? Actually, what, what you can do, which I, I should have said, you know, sometimes you want to <clears throat> do a calculation for many values of some parameter in the Hamiltonian. Let's say you want 100 values uh, and, and, you know, uh, they are pretty tightly spaced. Then when you have done one calculation, you can start the next one from the result of the previous one. That's already a, a good approximation, but <clears throat> sometimes that's actually not good. Because if you want the, also some excitations, if you start with something that's very close to the ground state, it has very little of the excitations in it. So you may improve the convergence of the ground state, but the excited states may actually converge slower because your starting state had such small coefficients of uh, the excitations in it. So, so what you propose is true for the ground state, but it may not be the best for excitations. Oh, right, you mean to make sure that the ground state is really the biggest in magnitude, right? <clears throat> so so first, I didn't point it out, but I guess it's obvious. If uh, the highest state is also the largest in magnitude, then of course you will converge to you know the, the highest energy state instead. Normally, you don't actually need an offset because normally it's just the case that uh, you know, the ground state energy is negative and, you know, with the Hamiltonian defined in the conventional way, <clears throat> that is normally also the biggest in, in magnitude already. Otherwise, you know, you will see very easily that you converge to some, you know, high energy state and, and it's easy to just roughly guess what the offset should be. Uh, Let's see, you know, actually the, the funny thing is you may actually not really need it uh, because maybe if, yeah, I think it, it looks like you should need it, but I know I have done some cases where actually it seemed like you, it worked even if, I mean, the thing is it, 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 how can you guarantee that it doesn't go to your highest energy state? Like if we go, <clears throat> go to this formula, <clears throat> this one here, right? If uh, if, uh, you know, if, if it's your highest energy state that is the highest in magnitude, then it, it should not work. Um, but I, I think it, maybe if the difference is very small and your starting state just happens to be, you know, much, much, contain much, much more of the ground state than the highest energy state, it may actually converge to, you know, your ground state initially before it flows away. But yeah. Uh, if it happens, you will notice it very easily. So normally it's not a problem. Right. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So then uh, thanks and uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Okay. I turn this off now. I did. Oh. Um, maybe I should do it.